Hello folks, I'm Dave, I do security, um, been at AWS for a um, couple of years, um, been doing security for a couple of decades longer than that. So um, I've got until lunch, so this is going to be a bit of a canter, um, but uh, slides will be made available afterwards. So compliance in the cloud is a huge subject. I'm not going to be able to uh, cover all of it in the time available, but I'm going to do what I can. Um, certainly, uh, when it comes to starting with a brand new AWS account, um, there is really one place I'd recommend starting if you're just looking at a single account environment, but most of our customers actually run multi-account environments and there are good reasons for doing this. So one of the things I would refer you to is, uh, laser is working, just not reflecting, um, is uh, this little session here, which is uh, details on setting up multi-account architectures in AWS and why it's a good idea to do so and how to go about doing so. So for a single account, um, who here, show of hands, is familiar with the um, Center for Internet Security and the benchmarks they've been doing for a whole bunch of years? Just a couple of you, okay. I would very much recommend checking these guys out. Um, I've been using their Linux and Apache benchmarks for years and I'm a big fan. Uh, we've been doing some work with them uh, last year and there's more coming this year. Um, to produce a um, couple of benchmarks specifically focused on use of AWS. Um, the uh, Web Services Foundations benchmark there is now in version 1.1, which came out in November. And the whole point of this document is to answer the question of, okay, so I've just minted myself a shiny new AWS account. What should I go about doing in order to put a decent security benchmark as a baseline into that account before I go deploying my valuable assets in it? So in the manner of all um, the other Center for Internet Security um, benchmarks, the document actually is just a collection of recommendations where each recommendation comes, comes in a standard form. So you've got a description, you've got a reason why it's a, re why it's a recommendation, you've got a bunch of runes to determine whether the recommendation's in place or not, and another bunch of runes to put it in place if it isn't. Um, now, these runes in the um, Foundations benchmark and also in the three-tier web benchmark that we've produced that's in a 1.0 at the moment, um, those are just regular AWS CLI commands. So um, you can script them up in whatever shell of your choice. But um, we also realized after we'd got the benchmark in place that um, it wasn't beyond the wit of man to turn them into a CloudFormation benchmark with the idea that you can create your new account, have your CloudFormation template already in S3, um, and then um, just add permission to the S3 bucket for the um, new account to read the file from that bucket, execute the template, and you're 80% of the way to having all your security in place um, from a CIS perspective. Some of these some of the actual recommendations can't actually be automated yet. That's something we're working on. But the, um, the currently beta version of the um, CloudFormation template for the Foundations benchmark is up on GitHub in our AWS Labs account. Um, I very much encourage you to check it out and we'd love to hear some feedback as to how you get on with it. So, the thing about standards, as uh, Andrew Tannenbaum put it, the wonderful thing about standards is there's so many to choose from. And we're not short of uh, compliance with a lot of them. Um, this is not the full set by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you'll notice the uh, GovUK uh, one in the middle there in that um, in our Dublin and now London regions, we have uh, gone and got um, cybersecurity essentials certification in place. Um, also, for those of you who have been uh, watching AWS for a while, you'll have noticed that uh, we've been on G Cloud since I think it was G Cloud 4, so we've met the procurement framework requirements for that. Um, we also have a uh, white paper out that um, a friend of mine wrote in response to the CESG, now NCSC, um, Cloud. Um, um, cloud guidelines, and uh, that's available on our public website. Um, and that's also something that I can, uh, I'm happy to talk through um, in detail um, over lunch if uh, that works for you guys. So 
with all our certifications, the magic's in the scoping. This is, this is true of certifications in general. Um, now, if a service isn't actually in scope, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't use it in the context of a particular solution. It's just that you can't use it to touch the kind of data that that certification standard defines as being sensitive. So nothing stops you, for instance, having a framework that goes processing um, that, that's in scope for PCI DSS uh, using a service that isn't in scope for PCI DSS, let's say, or let me think. Um, I'll have to think of, I'll, I'll, have to, um, look, I'll have to look at my list later. Um, but you, so, long as that, so long as that service doesn't actually go touching CVV or PAN, then there's nothing actually stopping you using it. Um, so um, obviously we, um, we do what we do from certifying um, our baseline solutions. You need to get your auditors in to um, certify what you build on top and how you run it. Um, because as we'll get on to a little bit later, um, you can take a whole bunch of uh, compliant building blocks and build wildly non-compliant solutions out of them. But we're trying to make it easier to um, actually um, to get through your audits as needed. So a few things about the different kinds of audits we go in through. Um, first of all, um, when we actually get our audit, when, when we get our audits done, we use auditors that um, have a decent reputation in the field. So for our um, our SOC and ISOs, we use E and Y. So uh, that's um, the um, arm of uh, Ernst and Young um, that does um, the the certify point solution. Um, for PCI for PCI DSS, we use Coalfire, who um, have they're US based, but um, they've been around. Uh, they've been around the um, PCI game from, for a great many years, and I tend to I tend to see them cropping up regularly. Um, the thing about the thing about these different kinds of reports we do is that they really come in two flavors. So um, ISO certifications um, 27001, 27017, and 27018 for PII um, that we now have on the uh, London region as well. Um, along with PCI DSS, they're very much point in time audits. So auditor comes in, goes through their checklist, talks to appropriate people, examines various technology, examines documentation and operational procedure, all being well signs on the, on the dotted line, it goes away again. Um, there's a subtlety here in that we do have um, in we, we do have in our ISO audits the means whereby um, auditors can come back in and do essentially surveillance audits um, at any time. But things get a lot more interesting when you look at our SOC reports. SOC, I, I kind of consider certainly SOC 2 to be the kind of audit that differentiates between people, re re really shows people who want to show continuity of um, of um, quality of operation. It came about um, when the big four auditors realized that ISO 27001 didn't actually cover um, operational excellence continuity. And uh, when you actually um, put your environment in for a SOC audit, the audit actually needs to be backed up by six months worth of evidence of continual compliance. So that can be uh, log data, things like, uh, things like breach reports, ge general, um, the, the, the general reporting that you'd expect to find in a rigorous organization. This is also why um, the London region is not currently in scope for SOC because it just hasn't been up for six months. We're hoping to actually um, get it into scope for SOC um, in the next round of our six monthly audit cycle, which will be around April. So I'd expect the um, reports, the first SOC reports to come out with um, London region in scope probably about May, about May time frame. Um, things, that you, um, things that you can do and uh, which we um, get assurance on for the US government is continuous monitoring. So uh, if you need to achieve GPG 13, that can be done in um, an AWS world. 
Um, we only actually have our um, US regions in scope for FedRAMP certification, but um, in order to actually get the certifications we get, I'll be talking about that in a, in a little while, we actually run all our regions worldwide in exactly the same manner, except where um, local standards specify that we can't. Classic case in point, um, when we, um, when we uh, manage our CCTV footage from inside our data centers, uh, the rest of the world, we hold that for 90 days. In the EU, we can only hold it for 30. Um, so, again, with certifications, if you need to use a service to touch certain kinds of sensitive data where the service isn't in scope, um, SQS wasn't in scope for a while for PCI DSS, um, then you can instead um, back off to standing a solution up on a service that is in scope, such as EC2, and then actually put the serv and then actually put the software that you're using to to um, provide the processing onto your side of the audit requirement. So, just a little list of what's in scope for what and. what tends to be used for what in terms of audits. So all these audit reports are available to you under terms of uh, NDA with us. Reason why uh, we only make them available under, N under NDA is that our SOC reports in particular, they're type two reports. So this means that as uh, part two inside them, as well as the usual checklists, they actually include a free form letter from our auditor um, describing what they think um, about our technology and, and operational procedures and physical security and so forth. Um, I would, however, recommend that um, even if you're not processing credit card data, which I expect most of you guys won't be, it's still worth getting the PCI DSS audit report because of what it actually covers in other areas. So um, if, um, if there is a need to do any forensic investigations. There's details in there about um, how we actually comply with that. Short version is we do. In practice, we actually go to some considerable lengths to uh, assist as much as we can. But also, um, when it comes to guest-to-guest -guest separation um, in a hypervisor environment, we didn't actually do um, common criteria separation kernel protection profile certification because of the length of time it takes and the fact that we quite regularly update our hypervisor. And of course, updating it would then take it out of compliance because of the nature of common criteria certification. So instead, we actually have it in scope as an application under PCI DSS. So um, this means that, we ca that uh, financial services organizations can and indeed do um, stand up just regular guest instances um, on shared underlying physical boxes processing CVV and PAN. Um, if you have um, particular reasons from a risk appetite or compliance perspective why guest-to-guest -guest separation assurance in a hypervisor um, doesn't meet your requirements, then we have the means whereby you can stand up physical dedicated instances and what this means is that um, while you're still operating in a hypervisor world and have multiple um, guest slots available that you can put OS instances into, the way the OS placement algorithm works is that once you've actually put an OS instance on a box, the only other instances that can be physically put on that box are ones that also are owned by yourself. So you can actually extend the scope of your separation assurance from a hypervisor slot to a physical underlying server. Um, we've uh, been adding to our PCI certification recently. So we now actually have our um, web application firewall and our um, Docker management service in there, um, ECS. And the thing that uh, made my life a lot easier when it comes to PCI is um, a little while ago, we actually put our crypto services in there too. Um, actually doing crypto for PCI was uh, a bit entertaining before that point. ISO 27001 is what it is. 27018, 27017 is also there too. And as mentioned, this is where you will find our, um, NC, uh, our NCSC um, Cloud Security Principles white paper. 
and uh, that is something that uh, I expect you're going to be particularly interested in. As you can see, we've got a whole bunch of workbooks for um, standards from elsewhere. Um, I'd like to call a couple out, actually. Um, when it comes to which um, elements of security tend to fall within our remit and which are in yours, this one is actually worth working through. Um, it actually has a very good exposition as to um, the security controls that we implement. Also, of course, um, until um, a couple of years' time, um, we have a white paper on EU data protection, and that can be found there. Um, we can actually enter into an EU data processor agreement with you guys. Um, there's a um, document that can be downloaded from inside your AWS account. It's uh, 16 pages of close typed legalese. Um, once your legal team are happy with it, sign it, return it, and that then actually puts the agreement in place, which puts an onus on us to handle your data, no matter which AWS region you put it in, in a manner that is commensurate with the um, European Commission Article 29 Working Group Model Clauses. So we've got all these standards, and um, this, is the, this is the common set of what they do and what they're for, but we do get people asking about a whole lot more. Um, I get uh, interesting things across my desk from time to time around, um, around um, police-assured secure, secure facilities, among others. So this is where, really, you actually need to take the standard and um, dig underneath it into the actual control sets. So I don't know if you've actually had a look at websites like this, which um, make um, large mappings between individual controls between standards. Any particular favorite ones out there? But um, there is a large overlap between all these standards. I mean, ultimately, there is one way of doing security right that just varies a little bit based on individual risk appetites. So what we actually do ourselves is we have a master control set. Last I looked, it was some 1830-something controls. And when we actually need to um, get certification against an external standard, which we do on a fairly regular basis based on customer demand, we just make a mapping between our master control set <coughs> the con and the controls required in the external standard, and then we get the relevant set of auditors in. So by us being compliant in order, for, in order to satisfy specific subsets of customers, everyone gets to take advantage of this. Um, also, while there are lots of standards that we cover, we don't actually cover all of them in all contexts, as mentioned. So a common thing that we don't cover ourselves, um, the only common criteria certified service that we've actually got is our cloud HSM, uh, which under the lid is a um, SafeNet Lunar SA7000. That's because SafeNet for other contexts went and got that certification. However, this doesn't mean that um, you can't actually get common criteria certified capability on AWS. Um, we've got a uh, rather large now um, marketplace capability where you can uh, go buying environments from third party vendors, whether individual instances of um, virtual boxes that you go spin up on EC2, um, or now you can even actually um, download full environments that can deploy themselves based on CloudFormation templates. Um, so that is worth a, check in, worth a check out if you have a need for a particular requirement. Um, of the security technologies that are covered in the marketplace are actually really popular. So if I was to go actually looking at um, creating a control mapping framework um, for AWS. These are the headings I'd normally start with. I have actually done this exercise, but uh, as you might expect, it's one of these things where um, it turned into a great big spreadsheet and um, slides are not really the format to show it. But um, as a few examples, 
Um, if um, you need a set of requirements around environment management, um, there's some nice mappings here. Um, logging is something I'm going to be talking about um, in a little more depth later. Um, in particular, um, my favorite idea of a logging policy is um, if something moves, log it. If it doesn't move, watch it till it moves, then log it. And in practice, that's, that's not a hard thing to put in place in an AWS environment. Reason being, um, it's a truth hidden in plain sight, if you like. It's one of these things that's obvious until it just sits there being obvious until you think about it. Your management, logging, and monitoring environment needs to be at least as robust and secure and scalable and resilient as the live service environment it's, ma it's managing, monitoring, and alerting on. And in an AWS world, you can actually do that just by turning the appropriate logging services on and pointing them at storage in the form of an S3 bucket. The storage scales um, in, line with the, um, in, in line with the size of logs. And the services that actually do the logging, uh, we deal with the scaling for you. So it's actually quite a lot easier in an AWS world to um, come up with a uh, log gathering framework that scales automatically. And again, that can be uh, fed into, um, into GPG-13 compliant analytics systems. From a network perspective, a VPC is a layer two isolated lump of network. And uh, that is asserted both by our SOC and PCI auditors. A question that comes up a lot is whether you need to encrypt in transit when you're inside a VPC, instance to instance inside a VPC. Um, PCI DSS control four says that you have to encrypt across a public network, but it also says that a VPC isn't a public network. I've got customers who do encrypt inside a VPC, but to be honest, most don't. But we can go into details of um, how, the, uh, how, how uh, risk management actually lives underneath all of that. Um, encryption, um, lots and lots of people are using our key management service, KMS. And um, if you need to know more about that, we have a good white paper, um, KMS Cryptographic Frame um, Principles, which goes all the way into the maths as needed. Um, also, we have a uh, couple of videos we can point you at. Indeed, they're on links at the end of the session. Um, I was fortunate enough at um, our summit in uh, London last summer to uh, share a stage with um, Al Davidson, who's um, lead security architect for the Ministry of Justice. And uh, in that session where I was talking about crypto, Al, Al then went on to talk about the MOJ's use of AWS, um, including the use of crypto, and also how they do data classification and what their risk appetite is for putting workloads in AWS. So I definitely recommend that as one to watch. <coughs> and of course, for data management, um, you have the ability from S3 to go rotating your data into Glacier. And um, we now have uh, Glacier's Vault Lock capability, which um, is the first service that, um, well, first feature that AWS offers that actually gives you mandatory access control inside an AWS account. One thing you'll find if we wind up spending any time talking is I, is I have something of an obsession with mandatory access control. Uh, that's down from uh, having spent uh, lots of years um, doing old school B1 stuff. Um, before I actually joined AWS. So um, Glacier Vault Lock has been assessed by overseas auditors to meet the requirements of um, books and records retention for various US um, financial services regulators. Um, if you have uh, further and um, different requirements, that's something I'm happy to discuss. And of course, traditional security just works. Uh, from the point of view of what, what you do inside your EC2 instances, though we do have more capability to add to that that I'll be getting on to. Um, the obvious point here from a cloud perspective is that because everything is um, actually dealt with through an API, 
that API itself becomes a single point of visibility and control and auditability. I like to think of um, CloudTrail as actually being syslog for the API, only with uh, rather more integrity capability wrapped around it. You can actually put um, checksums of your, cloud, of your CloudTrail logs in a separate S3 bucket if you want to. But um, as a friend of mine put it, um, in a cloud environment, there's no virtual desks to hide your virtual servers under. And what the API returns you is true. So cloud does change the rules a bit. As I said, for a logging and, for a logging and monitoring framework, um, you don't really need to worry about the scaling of it because we actually do that for you. Um, but to look at how these things can work differently, to actually get API access in the first place, you have um, our, our identity and access management service being the, being the policeman for API access and control. It looks very much like Linux RBAC, for those of you who, who are familiar with it. Um, and um, in terms of what you can actually do to uh, filter um, the ability of people to use the API um, using conditions in the policy, there's a whole bunch of things you can filter on. Filter by region is a work in progress. It works for EC2 and RDS. Um, there are other things I'm working on and we're working on in general to actually make things work more generally for other services. Um, you can now also use um, CloudWatch events as effectively a cron substitute in order to make events happen according to um, your time frames as you need them to, so repeat alarms and so forth. And um, these, these logging services give you the ability to actually verify that what's in your API is what's going on. Um, CloudTrail and Config um, actually use um, different information sources under the lid inside AWS. So you can actually use them to do um, checks and balances against each other if you want to. If you put all this together, you wind up getting something that looks a lot like this. So if you have your log sources here, um, you then put them into either um, CloudWatch logs for um, simple string match processing, or you can put them into an S3 bucket and have them picked up by the security incident and event management and monitoring tool of your choosing. Um, if you wind up getting something that um, is considered uh, notification worthy, you can push that to our simple notification service, which enables you to get notified um, or have automated systems notified by any of these mechanisms. Uh, we're working on making CloudTrail faster. Um, it, has, um, it, it normally um, actually has a uh, latency of between five and 15 minutes between an event happening and the log, and the log record landing in an S3 bucket. We're looking to get that down to two to four. So essentially you can say that from log generation event here to you getting information about it over here, you're looking at maybe six, seven minutes tops once we're done, which to be honest, ain't bad. Um, especially when you bear in mind that this works no matter the scale of the estate you've got in place. Um, in terms of further controls that um, a lot of people talk about, we have um, our own um, WAF capability, which can be used in tandem with um, on instance or bump in the network box out of AWS Marketplace, WAF capability, um, also um, IDS and IPS. You can do either um, on the host, which is the way I tend to prefer it, um, or in the <coughs> network with a separate appliance. VPC flow logs um, gives you essentially S-flow style tuples of source and destination IP addresses and port numbers, packet count, byte count um, on all your network traffic around, uh, around inside your VPC. Um, so, if, um, so this is essentially uh, what you can do as a substitute for having individual network taps on individual network interfaces. And I would not, um, I, I, I would be careful to have a look at the subtlety of what you can do with S3. I already mentioned its use as um, 
your destination of your logs, but you can actually set it up um, both using, uh, using lifecycle rules into Glacier, but also with cross-account sharing to actually make it a write-only entity for your log generation sources here. So if you actually share it cross-account write-only, then the, um, the, bucket, the bucket itself from the perspective of the log generators um, is something that can't be, can't be read, can't have its contents listed, and can't have its policy accessed. And having uh, spent more time than I care to contemplate doing this stuff, that's essentially mandatory access control. Incident management. This is something I have a whole separate presentation on, though I'm afraid it hasn't actually been videoed yet. But um, as mentioned, we help as much as we can, which is rather a lot. We can get stuff um, out of our environment that um, is hard to get from inside um, the AWS environment from a user perspective. So if needs be, we can get things like uh, full, full packet captures and um, also potentially for some instances memory dumps. But in the event of there being an incident, a cloud environment is actually less disruptive to operations than a regular one. Than a regular one, I've been involved in some incident in, in some incident management and response work. And um, in a traditional world, you wind up having to hire extra kit in and have that um, take over live processing while you do forensic analysis on the compromised systems. In a cloud world, you, in a cloud world, it's a whole lot easier. So. The other thing you can do, and which cloud particularly excels in, is automation. And I don't think I'm going to have time to go through this properly. But Config essentially is a configuration management database for those of you who uh, cleave to ITIL, whereby changes as they happen, and they will in a dynamic environment, enable you to get information out about the um, status of your environment at any particular time with a snapshot capability, or also a history of individual assets over time. Config rules is essentially Lambda integration for config, so you're able to actually get um, events uh, and your own code to run whenever a change happens in your environment. So this means that um, when a change happens, you can actually trigger arbitrary code that you can write in Python or Node.js or Java, uh, which will examine the state of your estate, determine whether any of the changes that have happened are undesirable ones, and either alert you to this fact or potentially revert them. So you can check against your own rules. Or, have, uh, or, or we maintain a set, a managed set for you. So this is an example of the timeline you can get out of config for the history of an asset and the changes have happened, that have happened to it. And the information that config will gather, as you can see, there's quite a lot of metadata that you're able to get, um, that you're able to get and search on. In reality, it actually looks like this under the lid. It's all just JSON structures. And because this is uh, not exactly transparent for human readability, you can actually, uh, we actually map relationships between assets so you can determine whether, for example, a given security group is applied to given IP addresses which, are which is bound to a specific instance which is on a specific subnet in a specific VPC. Um, config doesn't support everything yet, but it supports most of the things that people tend to deploy inside, of, inside a VPC in the context of EC2. As mentioned, config rules are Lambda functions and are thereby triggered by changes, or you can trigger them yourself um, using, um, using CloudWatch events. Um, again, it's just code under the lid. And we actually maintain a set of managed rules ourselves. There's about 20 of them, or you can write your own. So um, we also curate another area on GitHub that is a repository of config rules, so ours and public contributions. Um, identity and access management I've already mentioned, but um, config is able to detect changes in this as well. So when you go adding new users or changing permissions or so forth, that can all be picked up. And recently, we've actually gone and launched a bunch of services that enables you to look inside your EC2 instances as well. 
So Inspector is a next generation um, com compliance issue detector that goes beyond what you can do in things like OS Query and OpenSCAP in that um, it runs continuously for a period of time. It's agent based. And what this, uh, what this means is that um, <coughs> if your code at any point um, goes outside the scope of, um, what your, uh, of uh, what's in the common vulnerability and exploit database or goes beyond um, what, uh, what we recommend for our own um, internal processes. Again, it's um, an internal tool that we spun out. Um, or if it um, actually breaches CIS benchmarks um, for, um, certainly we've got um, a whole bunch of Linux variants under this, then you'll wind up getting an alert for it. Uh, these will wind up looking like um, CVE reports because a lot of them actually are. We've also gone and introduced another couple of capabilities that are of interest in EC2 Systems Manager, which is a collection of little tools for um, looking after large fleets of EC2 instances. So in particular, Inventory allows you to do things like, uh, very much like OS Query, where you're able to determine things like patch configuration on your instances. And, uh, and then determine whether, any, whether any, any instances don't have specific needed patches applied. It integrates into config, and you can then go actually applying things as uh, applying patches or changes as needed. Um, so, for example, you can determine whether um, you, you can actually put fairly complex Boolean or SQL style queries together um, to identify instances that are outside the scope of your policy. State Manager gives you very much like what, um, OS, what OS Query or the fix version of, uh, or, or the fix capability in OpenSCAP will give you. Um, whereby you're able to uh, write arbitrary tests to determine whether um, specific files are in specific states from the point of view of ownership and content. And you can actually um, put things back as they need to be. Finally, and sorry I'm running just a couple of minutes late, um, we have our Enterprise Accelerator initiative. As I said at the beginning, it's possible to build wildly non-compliant architectures out of uh, compliant parts. Um, we, tr we take a very Unix approach in that we trust you guys to know your business more than we do. So um, we trust you to be doing things that are smart to you that might have us scratching our heads if uh, we knew what they actually were. So we've um, so far put um, we've, we've so far done this exercise on two standards. We've done it on NIST 853 um, because of uh, requests primarily from customers the other side of the Atlantic. We've also done PCI DSS. If you um, feed um, AWS Enterprise Accelerator and one of those two standards into your favorite search engine, you'll wind up coming to a um, quick start page. Um, br browse down to the bottom and you'll get um, the actual sets of assets. So what we include is um, a bunch of documentation, bunch of diagrams that uh, we expect to be used as baselines for um, putting in documents for your auditors. We also include mappings of um, control frameworks to um, capabilities and mitigating technologies that can be deployed in AWS. And most interestingly, we include CloudFormation templates. And there's an anecdote that I don't have time to go into on this, but if we catch up over lunch, I certainly can. The idea is that this is intended to make CloudFormation easier to use and deploy in a consistent and compliant manner. So I very much recommend you check this out, even if you aren't using CloudFormation already. It makes it a lot easier than, um, than it is to start from scratch with. Finally, we've got our well-architected framework, um, which is all about actually ensuring that um, your environment um, is sensibly configured from these perspectives. There is a fifth um, pillar that has uh, come along that we're, that we're writing a separate white paper for on operational excellence. Um, we started originally with a single paper um, just on the um, framework in general. There are now individual white papers for each of these areas. The security one's good. 
um, that I'm uh, talking to the author at the moment about potentially extending it. Finally, training. There's a bunch online, a lot of it's free. Um, this is a good one, particularly for auditors, um, but we do also have um, training courses as well. And sorry, I've uh, had to go at a bit of a, well, the canter turned into a gallop, um, but in terms of further resources, these are good places to go looking and for information about how to go about setting up um, multi-account architectures, take a look at this one. Um, obligatory plug, I'll be doing uh, a, sli a, a slightly updated version of this one tomorrow. Um, and the rest essentially um, speaks for itself. Thank you.